are the attributes of a great leader? Great leaders set high standards. That's number one. And great leaders express caring. That's number two. All the rest are details. Someone wants to become an entrepreneur. Someone wants to grow as an entrepreneur. What's the best way to do that? Would it be nice to know something about the industry before you're going to go disrupt it? Yeah. And I'll say, have you worked in the industry? Do you know anything about it? Anybody in it? No, no, no. Well, go do that. Would you say as an entrepreneur, following your passion and making your passion your business, the money will follow? No. no so you think- you know, There are plenty of passionate people who do stupid things. Passion might provide you energy. It doesn't provide you insight. Welcome. My name is Daniel Drillet and I'm the president of the Global Young Entrepreneur Society. The Global Young Entrepreneur Society is an international organization that supports exceptional young people in achieving entrepreneurial growth. Co-hosting the interview with me today is Lewis Swire. Lewis is a co-founder of GS and the director of our UK operations. He is the editor-in-chief of The Curious Times. Our guest today is Professor Leonard Schlesinger of Harvard Business School. Professor Schlesinger is a Baker Foundation professor at the Harvard Business School, where he serves as chair of the school's practice-based faculty. He served as president of Babson College from 2008 to 2013, was vice chairman and chief operating officer at Limited Brands, which was at one point the parent company of Abercrombie & Fitch, Bath & Body Works, and Victoria's Secret. He was a professor of sociology and public policy and senior vice president and counselor to the president at Brown University and was executive vice president and chief operating officer at major Cathay chain, Aubon Payne. He is the author or co-author of 13 books, the most recent one being What Great Service Leaders Know and Do. He has served on the editorial boards of five major academic journals and has published numerous management case studies that have sold well over 1 million copies. Professor Schlesinger currently serves as the director of RH Inc. and the DP Acquisition Corporation. He serves on the advisory boards of the College for Social Innovation and Datapoint Capital. He also serves as an advisory council member of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Initiative and as a member of both the Council on Competitiveness and the Council on Foreign Relations. P Professor Schlesinger holds a Doctor of Business Administration from Harvard Business School, an MBA from Columbia University, a Bachelor of Arts in American Civilization from Brown University, and an Honorary Doctor of Laws from Babson College. We are very pleased to welcome Professor Leonard Schlesinger. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on. You were a leader both in business and in academia. How did being a professor and being a business leader impact each other? And after I got my MBA, I went to work in a paper mill in Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, uh, making facial tissue and, uh, and was working with uh, a team on the night shift um, in a unionized facility, trying to figure out in my first uh, supervisory role what made them tick and how to move forward. Um, I learned an absolute ton. Um, mostly from the mistakes I made in trying to be a supervisor and creating the illusion that I was trying to develop them as opposed to the fact that they were trying to develop me. And, um, and after a period of time, <clears throat> was increasingly interested in the dynamics of the group organization that we had in the factory. And uh, there were a number of folks studying uh, the factory and the process. And, uh, and it became an opportunity for me after three years uh, to move from that manufacturing setting to actually um, uh, signing up for a doctoral program where I could study essentially the experiences I had on the floor and try and understand much more about them. That really created a scenario that ended up being played out for the rest of my professional life, where I would find myself with some very, very practical questions that emerged in a job-related setting. I'd go into academia uh, to try and get my arms around the issues and try to build theory and concepts uh, that would help us to understand those scenarios, uh, which would in turn raise other interesting practical questions that I could only address by going back into industry or by tackling a major consulting project. And so the rest of my, you know, the next 45 years of my life was this continuing shift from being a, a professor to being a, a manager and or a consultant um, and uh, I do believe at the core 
that uh, they had very tight impact because we were staying on the same topics in the same place. Uh, and having the dedicated time to actually think about these issues as an academic uh, ended up making me a better manager. Uh, and being a manager ended up uh, providing me with sets of questions born out of practice that I could then revisit in academia. Interesting. Thank you. And as Daniel just mentioned, you have been a leader in both business and in academia. What are the attributes of a great leader? I'm sure you see that uh, books on leadership get published almost every 15 minutes. Uh, and by and large, they're all basically the same. Um, uh, there's a classic book in the social science literature called Stockdale's Handbook of Leadership. It's about 800 pages, very small print, uh, and purports to cover all of the empirical research on the leadership questions that we uh, struggle with today um, up until the 80s. Um, it's an extraordinary volume. I don't recommend it unless you have a, a sleep problem or you're an academic, but, the, um, but, uh, but it does cover the territory. And at the end of 800 pages, you see two basic things. Great leaders set high standards. That's number one. And great leaders express caring. That's number two. All the rest are details. And so whether it's servant leadership or senior leadership or you know, service leader, it doesn't matter. I mean, what you need to know at the core um, is we have to be focused on uh, on high standards and we have to be focused on caring because the old axiom of people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care plays in every managerial setting known to mankind. Your latest book is entitled What Great Service Leaders Know When Do. So what makes a service business successful? This is the simplest idea in the world. What we try to cover in the front, front chapter is uh, a logic that we can demonstrate empirically that most people believe doesn't exist, which is most people believe that management is all about making trade-offs um, trading off profitability for customer service, work for employees, et cetera, and so forth. And so we articulate the notion of what we call the service trifecta. We can demonstrate a portfolio of firms that are simultaneously able to be great places to work, um, extraordinarily high levels of profitability delivering to, um, to shareholders, and consistently on the most admired customer list. So uh, you can, in fact, you should recognize that what is articulated as a trade-off, by and large, is an opportunity for you to engage in and or. Uh, and the true service leaders and service leadership institutions are the ones who are capable of juggling those three balls simultaneously. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this was quite a while ago, but around 30 years ago, you were involved in the process of redesigning Taco Bell. What were the key takeaways from that experience? <laughs> it really was 30 years ago, 1992. Um, and the, the big issues to Taco Bell in 1992 were very simple. <clears throat> Coming off of some less than stellar performance, um, they, had, uh, they engaged in a promotion of, at that time, what was called the 59, 79, 99 cent menu. So the core items on the menu were available for one of those three prices. And, and all of a sudden, the lines got very long at Taco Bell. And uh, because there was a whole generation of customers that were interested in low prices. And uh, the only problem with that model was that they couldn't, um, they, they couldn't make money at 59 cents. So a major part of my agenda going in with a, a number of the senior leaders in the organization uh, were to actually rethink the organization and the model on, pitch, on which the, organ, the company was built so that they could continue, they could continue to um, uh, evolve the nature of the distribution system in, in a way that enabled them to actually deliver a lower price. So a few th things that came out of there that we really learned. One key takeaway is to really, really, really understand your customer. So... Um, so we understood at the core who the core customer was at 59, 79, 99. It was what we call the penny pinching hufu, HFFU, the high frequency fast food user. Um, uh, and the high frequency fast food user, it turns out at that time, was doing double digit number of visits to fast food in a week. So they're pretty easy to spot. Um, uh, so given the frequency of that customer base, you really wanted to figure out, now that we knew who they were, we really wanted to figure out what they wanted. And it turned out through a pretty sophisticated <laughs> conjoint analysis in the early 90s, one of the more sophisticated analyses that were done in market segmentation at that time, we discovered that the customer really wanted four very simple things. And we called it fact. They wanted fast food fast, F. They wanted orders accurate, A. In a clean environment, C. At the right temperature, hot food, hot, cold food, cold. And, uh, and so it sounds to you, it'd be pretty simple. Who can't deliver that? Well, the reality is fast food was anything but fast in 92. Um, the error rate on orders was as much as 40%. Uh, when, the, when the stores got jammed up with customers, they ended up not being clean. Uh, and it was very easy, given the bottlenecks in the production system, uh, to mix up hot and cold. So they were not very good at those four things, yet those four things um, spelled, quite honestly, success with their core customer. And so a large part of the key takeaways from that experience is once you understood who that customer was and what that customer wanted, the next piece of our life was to give it to them. Now, 
that required a top to bottom redesign of Taco Bell, changing the configuration of the stores, the production system, the human resource systems, the uses of technology, um, you name it. And we went on for about three years uh, doing all of that work at that point and got a fair amount of notoriety for it. But at the core, if you're saying, you know, if I'm a member of this society, I'm trying to figure out what do I take away? One, make sure you know who your customer is. Two, make sure you know what they want. And three, work to give it to them. That works great in an industry where the customers know what they want, like food. But what about in innovative industries? Like, for example, when Apple came out in the iPhone, if they would have asked uh, their later iPhone customers what they wanted, they would have said they want a bigger BlackBerry. They didn't think they would want an iPhone. So do you have any thoughts on that? Great question. When you're talking about innovation, what you're suggesting is maybe customers don't know what they want. And so the question becomes one of how can you engage in experimentation to put things in front of them that enable them to share with you their insights and what you want. What you don't want to do is you don't want to go whole hog into a product configuration uh, or a service configuration, uh, invest tons and tons of money <clears throat> only to discover that you completely missed the mark. The key task, as all of you know, in entrepreneurship is to achieve product market fit and product market fit requires continuous iteration and continuous testing in early stages. So um, it's wonderful to tell the axiom of uh, Steve Jobs gave the customer what he wanted to give them, but that's not quite true. This was a heavily tested product. He did come up with the idea and he did obviously have strong perspectives on design, but ultimately they had to put this product in front of people to decide whether it was something they wanted. You have said, don't just be the best, be the only. How do you gain a monopoly on something that matters? So one of the key rules of strategy these days are that there are two, historically, two fundamental ways in which you could achieve strategic leadership. One was on cost leadership, okay? And the second was on differentiation. And we understood over time that cost leadership was a very precarious position uh, and enormously difficult to be able to sustain. So then we said, well, then we have to be different. Well, it turned out increasingly, as I was the college president of Babson and I was worrying about how the institution maintained differentiation in the minds of people who wanted to go to school there and want to support the institution, just being different wasn't really enough. What you needed to do is achieve a level of difference that was so fundamental that, uh, that you would absolutely be known for it and, uh, and it would be a long-term differentiation. Um, the ultimate in being the long-term differentiator is to be the only. Now, what you didn't talk about when you asked me that is to make it sound like a management folklore and it's not management folklore at all. You folks, and probably most of the people in your group are too young to know this, but don't be the best, be the only, um, came from um, a rock group, the Grateful Dead. And Jerry Garcia, who was the founder of that group, was interviewed <coughs> um, about the success of the Grateful Dead over time. And one of the things the Grateful Dead did is they had, they had raving fans. Okay, you hear about that in service. So they had tons of fans uh, who were deadheads who went from show to show to show to show to show. And in all of their shows, the Grateful Dead gave the best seats in the arenas um, to the deadheads who came with big tape recorders and recorded the shows. They didn't pay for recording the shows. They created this entire underground market um, of recordings of various shows around the world. And if you look at the Grateful Dead sites, you can find all of that stuff still going on to this day. And his comment was, we weren't the best singers. We weren't the best songwriters, but we were the only group that took their fans seriously. That simple idea coming from Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead shaped a lot of how I thought about being a college president. So as a former vice chairman of L Brands, what is the future of clothing retailers? It changes every few months and, and clearly has profoundly been impacted uh, by COVID as well. So there are three things going on. One is the middle market, i.e. you know, mass consumer, middle market apparel business. It's become a terrible business. It's so crowded and it's so congested. Uh, and there are so many players. So that's problem number one. <clears throat> it's just crowded. Problem number two, uh, and uh, today is Friday the 27th. So yesterday was the uh, the report, uh, the financial report for Gap. And, uh, and what Gap reported uh, was an illustration of a theory about broad scale uh, inclusiveness in fashion and sizing uh, that turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. So uh, lots of people were saying apparel brands uh, were exclusionary, uh, and they were keeping the plus size uh, or the super small size customers out of their stores. And so Old Navy decided they were going to go full tilt, and they were going to be able to satisfy everybody. Um, and they got completely overwhelmed with merchandise that couldn't be sold. And they completely missed out on the middle market, which was the core historical core of their uh, of their business. And so um, some tried and true assumptions about the business are being challenged in very significant ways. Online, Online has had the capacity to change um, the apparel business in pretty fundamental ways. 
um, with lots of businesses, uh, businesses like Everlane, that are completely transparent on both their supply chain and their cost structure. So uh, apparel retailing used to be a big black box and we would rely on being prescient and figuring out what you would want 18 months from now because that's how much time it would take for us to make the design the stuff, make the stuff, ship it over the United States and get it into our distribution system. Uh, and sometimes you were right and sometimes you were wrong. It was kind of crazy. <clears throat> We've really shortened the supply cycle. And uh, at the same time, we're discovering that beyond fashion, people have expectations of the industry uh, getting its acts together on sustainability. So um, uh, apparel is one of the most uh, ecologically wasteful industries uh, known to mankind. Uh, and there are now expectations that uh, both on the, uh, the fair trade product, the manufacturing of it, the, uh, the sustainability over time, the lasting power of it, that, uh, that we contribute to the environment rather than be a big drag. So net, 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 fashion has changed, sizing has changed, supply chains have changed, online and offline has changed. None of these things have made it a better business. How do recent supply chain problems like the zero COVID policy in China affect the fashion industry? It affects the fashion industry that's been sourcing from China. Uh, people, lots of, uh, lots of the sources have moved away from China uh, pre-COVID um, because China was becoming too expensive for middle market apparel. And so you found movements into Malaysia, you found movements into Sri Lanka. Uh, and then as you go to even lower price apparel, you found movements into Africa, uh, which has been a great source of, uh, of Walmart's clothing for years. So, so there is diversification in the sourcing base based on quality and based on cost. Uh, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that once you make this wherever you are, you've got to get it here. And that's become a real pain. And, and what do you make of the digital fashion revolution? So obviously, like, in fact, there are some brands that are upcoming and quite famous now already uh, that are, are purely focused on digital fashion assets and, and being sold within uh, places like the metaverse. What, what do you make well, of that? It, Victoria, it compl it's completely dependent on the extent to which sizing is critical and fit is critical, um, because whether you're online or offline, um, you know, you've got that problem. Um, technology has evolved over the last 20 years. And, and I watch it, I watch it with some measure of suspicion, uh, saying that we can improve the quality of fit and that's going to solve the problem and that's going to eliminate return rates, et cetera, and so forth. I'm still reading the same articles that are telling the same story and people are still making significant investments in the technology, but nobody solved it. Babson College, where you were a president, is considered one of the best universities for entrepreneurship. Can entrepreneurship be taught? And I sure as hell hope so. <laughs> Why do you want to be the president of a college that's teaching something that can't be taught? So, I mean, it, it, it's... um. It requires you to understand at least the way in which I frame entrepreneurship, and it might be different from the way in which you do it. Um, from my perspective, entrepreneurship is a method, okay? It's a method just the same way the scientific method is, and we've been teaching the scientific method uh, in educational institutions for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. So once we understand some of the dimensions of the method known as entrepreneurship, um, you, of course you can teach it. Uh, and uh, what it requires you to do is to understand that the best teaching of that method by and large, is almost always experiential with coaching as opposed to lecturing from a textbook. But uh, we were committed at Babson to defining the method, understanding the method, diffusing it broadly, and building experiential education that be, was able to support it. Okay, Because the book before, What Great Service Leaders Know and Do, that I wrote was called Just Start. Uh, and the Just Start book is actually designed to lay out methodologically <clears throat> what entrepreneurship is all about. And, and it really requires you to understand at the core uh, as an entrepreneur um, who you are, what you want, and how to get it, and to actually understand uh, that this is about taking small steps, okay? Entrepreneurship is about taking small steps, uh, learning what you can learn from taking those small steps, and then shaping the next step. And so uh, lots of the books and lots of the celebrations of entrepreneurship are all about, you know, this person taking a dark flying leap. Uh, and, and it does happen on occasion, but much rarer than you might think. Uh, it's usually about um, iterations and testing to achieve product market fit uh, and small steps that teach you what you need to do to take the next step. And that's in essence what we teach. It's really interesting. So in, in one of your books, the chapter is called Learning Entrepreneurship Means Living Entrepreneurial. Right. Um, living Entrepreneurial, sorry. Uh, what, what is the correlation between an entrepreneur's lifestyle and how successful they are in business? By living entrepreneurially, I meant at the core, understanding that the maximal learning comes from actually being in the center of it, of everything at all. So for example, I just finished teaching I, you know, I'm teaching um, first year MBAs right now at Harvard, and I just finished taking 70 of them with me for 10 days to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and uh, we spent two months on campus uh, learning about Louisville, learning about cities, second tier cities, learning their problems and their issues, 
And once we reach the natural limitation of that, we need to go to Louisville and experience it and, the, and experience it physically. And so um, I had sourced a dozen projects for groups of six um, that required them to uh, build relationships with clients, um, tackle uh, tackle the, the book learning into on the ground learning, to build contextual intelligence by having their feet on the ground and experiencing the place in ways that can only be done physically. Uh, and, uh, and then to use design thinking methodologies to be able to advance um, uh, opportunities and, uh, and uh, hypotheses about what these organizations might do to go forward. I don't know any way to ground those kinds of learning without getting people on the, on the ground. If you could restart today, which industry would you want to join, gain experience in? Which industries do you think will have the most amount of growth in the coming years? It's not a question for me. I'm agnostic. I'm interested in problems, not particularly industries. So as you can see, I've done fast food. I've done some retail, a variety of different kinds of things. And so for me, as if I can find an interesting problem, like I did in airlines in the early uh, in the early 80s with the startup of People Express Airlines, which was trying to kind of start up an airline in a new and different way. Um, I, I, I don't much care about the, the industry segment. Uh, I'm sure I find some more attractive than others, but I'm much more interested in the nature of the problem of defining, designing, and delivering service for a customer that works. Uh, and uh, and so I sit back and say, you know, for all of the folks who are thinking about which industry is good and which industry is bad, that's completely uh, time bound. Uh, industries all go through different kinds of cycles at different points in time. Uh, and so if you're thinking about attractiveness, you know, what I told you today would probably be wrong six months or now. Um, but can you find really interesting problems that whet your appetite? Um, you'll learn a lot more things by starting a problem-focused orientation than an industry-focused orientation. You have been chief operating officer of a few large corporations. How do you achieve operational excellence? I mean, at the core, the cool thing about being a COO is you actually get to do stuff. Uh, I, everybody glamorizes the CEO job, but the COO job is there every day trying to figure out how to get stuff done. Much, you know, it might be less strategic and it might be very much in the service of the strategy of the CEO and the rest of the organization. But um, at the core, I really love uh, operational tasks. And I believe it's very difficult very difficult to become an effective entrepreneur at the product or service level without a series of experiences that allow you to actually uh, live in a world of, of, of operational execution. So that's number one. <clears throat> number two is understanding at the core uh, that operational execution varies dramatically based on the nature of the business you're in and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, but it does require you to get clear about what kinds of goalposts you're trying to achieve and, and, and reach. Uh, and then you can reverse engineer that into an operating process to get you there. Uh, but there aren't there aren't universal notions about operational excellence other than clearly defined outcomes and metrics that really matter to customers and uh, rigorous measurement on your performance against that. And then at the you know at the human resources level, uh, a group of people who are working with you um, who are both capable and relatively autonomous and who team well together to help make that happen. Which business books that had major influences on you would you recommend for young entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. I, I still, I don't find that uh, the entrepreneurship um, wisdom uh, is useful beyond stories, okay? Um, and the concern is that the stories are edited to sell books and, and don't reflect a reality uh, uh, because the reality is a lot less, in some respects, interesting than the stories that get told. So for example, you know, all of these entrepreneurs who have one hit, um, they write a book and they go out on a lecture tour to basically say, this is who I am and this is what I've done, aren't I great? And if you listen to me and pay me my money, someday you can grow up to be me. Uh, and uh, it's just not the way it works. It's by and large, people trudging along, working their way through oftentimes multiple failures with good process, until they iterate and find product market fit. And it's materially less glamorous than, uh, than these stories. Are there any particular business books that you do think have great value in them? They're classic books, which are not entrepreneurship books. They're basically management books. Um, so the entire Peter Drucker book library um, uh, in and of itself is uh, worth looking at. And then um, oh God, it's probably almost 50 years that Peter Drucker wrote a book called Management, Roles and Responsibilities. Um, again, a very thick book, um, but a very worthwhile book for people who are trying to get a context and a setting uh, for this very, very, very important work. There are some very good books that are on 
uh, on execution um, and uh, and their title execution. The former vice chairman of GE uh, wrote a book with Ram Sharan about that that covers it. And, and uh, lots of the other books about execution are really variations on the theme um, that, uh, that emerged there. Um, my colleague Tom uh, Tom Eisenman just wrote a book on uh, startup failures. Um, so as opposed to everybody running around talking about their startup successes, nobody wants to talk about startup failures. We've managed to get them to do it. And so uh, my guess is there's probably a lot more we can learn about what not to do uh, from startup failures than from some of these historical celebrations. So Tom Eisenman was our last guest, actually. I didn't even know that. So there, my timing is perfect. You were a top executive for multi-billionaire entrepreneur Les Wexner, who built such iconic brands as Victoria's Secret, Abercrombie & Fitch, and Bath & Body Works. How was Les Wexner as a person, and what was it like being around him? I connected up with Les in the middle of his career. He is probably... Uh, over his career, one of the best uh, merchants that we've ever seen. He's in, essentially invented the field of specialty retailing. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, I developed um, a friendship and a relationship with him when I was speaking to his management team, uh, and that evolved into a board seat, and that evolved into a job inside the company. Um, and uh, it was great working with him. Absolutely great at that time. Are there any particular lessons that you learned from him? Yeah, there was a phrase that we used to use. Warren Bennis, who'd been a consultant to the company, um, actually coined the phrase. Um, and I think it's a good way to be able to talk about less that uh, at his peak, he was a very good noticer. He went places and he saw things that people didn't see. He'd see the evolution of gene design in Japan. He'd see stuff when he was walking the streets in Europe. And so um, one of his major skills was his ability to translate noticing things as he went around uh, into commercial ideas. Someone wants to become an entrepreneur. Someone wants to grow as an entrepreneur. What's the best way to do that? Being yeah. one. By being one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, you know, yeah, I could tell you if you're, work, if you're worrying about a particular industry context and stuff like that, would it be nice to know something about the industry before you're going to go disrupt it? Yeah. So routinely, I'll tell some of my students who are coming in with this, quote, what they consider to be a phenomenal idea about uh, uh, an earth shattering opportunity to change the world in some industry. And I'll say, have you worked in the industry? Do you know anything about it? Do you know anybody about it? Anybody in it? No, no, no. Well, go do that. And they find my advice uh, somewhat um, of a letdown, right? Here I am coming in with this desire to be this great entrepreneur, and you're telling me to go get a job. I'm saying, well, we're going to increase the probability of your entrepreneurial venture exponentially if you actually know something about what you're doing. It's just that simple. So I am routinely and regularly uh, ensuring that people make sure, whether it's through a job, um, an internship, uh, lots of interviewing or lots of time spent on observation that they actually know something about what they're trying to do as opposed to flying blind. That's the best advice I can offer. So of all your roles, um, which, which role and position do you reckon you've learned the most from? Being a first line supervisor in a paper mill in 1972. Wow. Yeah. Nothing, I mean, I mean it's, I'm working the night shift from 11 PM to 7 AM um, I didn't realize that I got a daytime MBA and it didn't prepare you for the night shift. Um, uh, I'd never done anything like this. I'd never been far away from home uh, working. So on every dimension, it was something new. Would you say as an entrepreneur, following your passion and making your passion your business, the money will follow? No. So you think There are plenty of passionate people who do stupid things. And so, yeah. so, so passion might provide you energy. It doesn't provide you insight. Uh, and so I get very, there's not one single shred. And it, that's another one of those things. Of if you're passionate about this, you'll do it. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, you know, passionate people kill other people. I mean, there are all sorts of things about passion that are extraordinarily dysfunctional. They have nothing to do 
with skill and insight. So yes, passion might help motivate you to take the next step, but it still requires you to be rigorous around what that step is and the content of it. So it's passion with a mix of logic that creates the success. Yeah, passion could be a you know a motivational assist, but it's not the core. When you're overly passionate, it obscures your ability to see reality. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and to think long term as well. As we possible. move in, we move into our own respective reality distortion zones and can't read the tea leaves. And I'm, I'm sure you got a little bit of that from Tom Eisenman when we talked about the failures. You got your MBA at Columbia Business School. You spent a whole lot of time at Harvard. You were the president of Babson College. Who would you recommend each of these institutions for? So there's no question uh, that Babson has articulated. Um, the clearest uh, differentiated logic of about why it exists, okay? And so um, so if someone's really interested, particularly undergraduates in uh, engaging in entrepreneurial activities and thinks that they want to go to school, okay? Um, I can't imagine a better place to be in terms of the resources that are there, the faculty that are there, the support that exists for an undergraduate. Um, <clears throat> at the graduate level, um, Columbia and Babson and, uh, and HBS are really very different schools that do very different things in very different ways. So they're each really good at what they do, but it's quite different. Where do you think the future lies? In the United States, in the European Union, or in China? Tell me how the Russia-Ukraine thing is going to end up. Tell me how ultimately China is going to resolve zero COVID strategy. Uh, and I can tell you what the answers might be for the next three months. I'll give you managerial advice and entrepreneurial advice in the, in the, in the expression, I don't know. Uh, most of us uh, are unwilling to say, I don't know. Most of us want to you know, say, oh, we're a senior manager, we're a senior entrepreneur. Of course we know. And so we make stuff up um, uh, because people expect us to know. Um, a, much, a much more powerful tool is to be developing your capability to say, I don't know, and to engage in interactions with other people to go find out. We can find out answers to all sorts of questions um, with simple tests very quickly um, to at least get to the next step. And that goes through the iterative process of entrepreneurship I talked about earlier. So um, instead of saying, I'm gonna find out the answer and I'm gonna make a series of irreversible commitments against that, I'm gonna say much more likely, I don't know, and that's going to powerfully shape um, my uh, continuing um, mode of experimentation, which really does characterize the best entrepreneurial ventures. Thanks. Um, in any of your positions teaching, have you ever come across or taught any, any pupils that you thought would have been very successful in their future entrepreneurial ventures? <sighs> so I'm very lucky. I've had thousands and thousands of students okay, over the years. And so if any of them actually do something extraordinarily, extraordinary, I take credit, but it's the law of numbers, okay? So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just when you have so many thousand students, some of them are gonna be bound to be great. Um, uh, do I really have the ability to say, I saw Daniel uh, and I knew he was gonna be great? No, I can on the margin get a sense of people who are gonna be terrible, okay? Um, but, um, not really. I, for me, it's just much more fun to stay connected with people over the years and see how it evolves. You know, so we're now having finished commencement yesterday. We'll now move back into reunion modes for the next several weeks. And that will be a fun opportunity for me to reconnect with people and get a sense of how they're doing versus, you know, what I might have thought of when they were students of mine. Yes, absolutely. Well, then if you flip it around, what would be the red flags saying like, oh, no, this person is terrible and then not going to do very well it's almost always at the level of interpersonal skills oh, interesting. almost always where you just sit back and just say like no matter how smart that is person is no matter how talented that person is that person's not going to get any more than him or herself to work on an issue they just don't have it do the best students at hbs end up being the most successful in life <clears throat> Our highest academic standards is something called the Baker Scholar. These are the people who graduate at the top of the class. There's been all sorts of studies done over the years uh, that say they don't do particularly better than anybody else. 
Um, the direct the direct translation of academic excellence into managerial or entrepreneurial excellence just doesn't exist. You have been a successful business leader and academic. Where do you get your business news? Say the so, curious times. So I, I still am a very old fashioned, talk about being old fashioned in this world of technology, um, but I read three physical newspapers every morning, uh, the local paper, the Boston Globe, the New York Times paper of record and the Wall Street Journal. Um, <clears throat> I do the FT online. I do most of the magazines online. Um, uh, uh, I have lots of um, bells and whistle warning things that come up on my phone of various kinds of, uh, of stories. Um, yeah, it's just, I just read a lot. I mean, I mean, the good news is when you're an academic, you get paid to read a lot, but the, um, uh, but I've never gotten my, I've never shrunk from that habit. We have talked about the entrepreneurial method and how everyone can learn the entrepreneurial method, but is entrepreneurship for everyone? Is it for every type of personality? The entrepreneurial method enhances everybody's capability to get anything done. Whether someone translates the use of the entrepreneurial method into being a, a full-time entrepreneur is an individual of choice and, and, uh, and passion and presence. But there's no question in my mind in the world of uncertainty that we are in, the ability to use the method to experientially test ideas and test reality is at the very much at the center of what will enable anybody to do a better job of what they're doing. I mean, just no question at all. So that's why I'm fascinated with, um, I'm, I'm much more around saying I'm in the business of uh, teaching the entrepreneurial method. And uh, lots of people take the entrepreneurial method and turn it into an entrepreneurial career. Other people just use it as a new way to problem solve. If someone wants to learn the entrepreneurial method, what's the best way to do that? Read your book, Just Start? Uh, just Start, and by the way, um, read it. You only have to read like a chapter because it's the message is pretty obvious. We have come to the end of today's discussion, which was packed with great insights. On behalf of the Global Young Entrepreneur Society, Professor Leonard Schlesinger, Thank you very much for speaking with us today. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. I hope this ends up being useful.